I see Councillor Tier One Gonglo here, and I see prolific writer John Stewart. That's how I call him. Sometimes I read some of his articles, and you know, I just laugh. I say, yeah, this man, yeah, they've been around for some time. We are continuing our discussion on the progressives. You know, I this this there's a, there's a, there's a lot of discussions in the country about the progressives and the role they play in Liberia. Yesterday, you have Mo Ali and Ali Sila here. They were they were they, they face each other. In a very intelligent intellectual exchange, you know, Mo Ali said the progressives, uh, you know, they were not they were not supposed to shy away after the 1980 coup. They should have taken seas of the country because they were the educated, the soldiers were not educated. The progressives knew where to go, but they decided to shy away. He thinks that they do not have an agenda all through their life. The ass is just advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. They've never had an agenda for leadership of the country. So they should not sit and blame other people because they had the opportunity. They should have been there. John Stewart used to be one of the commissioners at the Liberia's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Councillor Tewan Gungle is here. He worked with Dr. Amos Sawyer and all these things. They both are my guests this morning. Uh, just uh, because of the viewer, I would like you introduce yourself. Probably somebody watching may not know the face of the person bearing the name. So I'm Tiawan C. Gonglo. I like to, you know, yesterday I fought with someone and just said Tiawan Gonglo. You have to put a C because as a first boy, okay. that's my rank. Nobody, you can be Tiawan P. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. But I'm, I'm uh, the standard bearer of the Liberian People's Party. That's what I want people to know now. But I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for about 35 years now. I've been teaching law at law school. I've been a human rights advocate. I won an award abroad for being a human rights lawyer. Uh, that's what I'm known for. And they call me poor man lawyer because I've not turned poor people away because they don't have money. I make money in the law practice for people who have money. But I've helped a lot of people who don't have money, including those who are in government now. Um, I was lawyer many times for Moba Molu, Jefferson Koji, Kalasko, Changi Babe, the rest of them. Um, every time we got into trouble, uh, when we were agitated against government. That's why sometimes when I say, yeah, when the clock changes, it can be, it can be different. Because today, I didn't expect that one of this government other agitators would be uh, brutally treated by government or so because they suffer brutality and I represent, I represent their cost, I represent their uh, uh, Swazi Genesis, no, that's what was, Vandana Patricks, uh, the CEO of the Economic Freedom Fighters, and he was one of the last person that got out of jail. But that's my that's my passion. I like to help people who are in trouble uh, when I'm available. I, I used to have an interesting contrast on a Taylor because as much as I'm very critical of Taylor, I used to perform legal services for his family members like his elder sister Edna. You serious? Sister, yes, his sister Peggy, his brother Bob Taylor. I could distinguish between my political view and stands on governance and my professional duty as a lawyer. So for example, Isaac Musa was detained and he was military advisor to the president. When he exceeded 48 hours, I was with JPC, we would file a petition for hippo couples to get him released and we got him released, we got him on the radio. And uh, they said, well, what can I marry you? You released a military advisor as if his rights were violated. At that point, I came in. You know, we have to build an orderly society based on law. And it cannot be emotional. It cannot be political. We have to do what is right at all times. I was a lawyer for the Dukies. When we couldn't find them, the family came to me. We filed a petition for reading hippie corpus. It was interesting. The second day of the argument, while we were in court, the president, President Taylor gave a speech to the nation. Uh, I regret to inform the nation that my friend Samuel Duki and his three family members have been killed. Then the list of that general T.C. go turn to George Andrew, who is dead now. I said, 
Welcome to Congo again, continuing this case. The rain of heavy carbon is meant to produce the living bodies of the people who are missing or are held in captivity. So the case ended right there. I mean, just to say some of the things that, that I do you as a okay. part of introduction. Let's, let's know John Stewart. Who are you, sir? My name is uh, John H.T. Stewart. <clears throat> I'm a journalist and a writer and an advocate for over how many years now? 40 years or so. And particip participant to history over a certain period. And I suppose this is why we're here this morning Yeah. to discuss. I like that. Participant to history over a certain period. Yeah. I like that. Are you both members of the LPP? Yes, we are both uh, founding members of the LPP. LPP. Founding members of the Yes. LPP. And our association goes beyond the... Uh, goes beyond that because LPP was uh, not organized until 84, know, 85, after the ban on politics was lifted. But we've been comrades at university long before then. We'll come there. Yeah. Now, well, let's, let's, let's begin with... We both right. went to jail April 3rd. This April month means much for us. You both went to jail? Yeah. yeah. April 3rd. Okay. Like, like hey, that's why I've called you. <laughs> we'll talk about that. John Stewart, let me hear you first. How did the LPP come to Bain? How did you establish the LPP? What can you remember? Gonglo will come in later. Yeah. Well, the LPP came into, the LPP was birthed from the wombs of Moja. Moja is the Movement for Justice in Africa. And uh, that name was coined from Swahili, Uhuru na Umoja, Freedom and Unity. So we adopted the name Moja, meaning Unity. Movement for Justice in Africa, the acronym MOJA. Well, this was, uh, ours was a liberation support group, and uh, mainly trying to raise consciousness about, uh, amongst Liberians about the situation in South Africa, where you had a minority, uh, a white government oppressing the black majority. And uh, we were not, I, I, I would say we were not the, the, the first in this endeavor, because Liberia as a nation has a history of taking South Africa to court, to the World Court, suing South Africa to the World Court for the violation of human rights. There were many, many, many uh, liberation leaders who came through here. Nelson Mandela, for instance, uh, was given a Liberian passport to travel. There were so many. Even while we were at the university, we met Sam Nyuma, we hosted him at the university. We hosted uh, Stokely Carmichael, the late. Mm -hmm. All these people are the past now. And uh, so we continued on the path of conscientizing our people to the conditions in South Africa. And the conditions in South Africa were, in a way, similar to the conditions here. Because you had Firestone, for example, paying starvation wages to workers. You also have Firestone in South Africa producing tires and paying starvation wages to workers. So when you talk about uh, the conditions in South Africa, people here were quick to draw parallels to their own situation here, you know. And at the time, when we started our advocacy, there were laws on the books that denied participation to a wide majority of the people. You're talking about the property law. One could not vote if he did not own property in fee simple. So you will have a hut in a village, but that hut, you know, you don't own that hut in fee simple, so you can't vote. You see, so uh, those are one of the things we advocated against, and trying to establish the, uh, a, a democratic order. Who was your first chair president, the LPP? Your founding chair president. I'm, I'm getting with that. Okay. So uh, at the Moja Congress, because during the period in the 70s. Uh, agitating, raising consciousness, and all of that. As a matter of fact, when PAL was organizing in the U.S., the, we used to assist PAL distribute its leaflets and what, what have you. So a lot of people thought that we were one and the same, but we were not in essence. So by 1980, the clamoring call for the formation of a political party to address the situation here because we were, we were dealing mainly with the situation outside of Liberia and drawing parallels to the situation here. So, but the call came 
mounting calls came for the establishment of a political party to articulate the views and interests and, 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 and advocate for the interests of the Liberian people. So in 1980, uh, the, 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 following the disturbances of 1979, in 1980, in March 1980, Moja held its Congress and made a resolution to that effect that a political party will be formed mm -hmm. to articulate our interests nationally. And uh, But that didn't happen right away. Because right after the Congress in March 1980 came the coup mm -hmm. of 1980. And so the military banned all political activities and uh, that's how we're not able to get off the ground there and then until the ban on politics was lifted in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, 1984. And uh, again, we did not participate in the elections in uh, 85 because our party was banned. Dr. Sawyer was our first chairman. He was the founding chairman. And we did not participate in those elections because we were banned. Similarly to the Progressive uh, People's Party of Bacchus Matthews was also banned. They did not participate in elections. And we, we uh, rallied, our party we rallied to the support of Jackson Doe, who was the candidate of the Liberia Action Party. Yeah. And in reality, he actually won the elections, but the, the results were stolen. So basically, that's... Councilor Gonglo, let's hear you. Let's hear you, sir. Well, yeah, I was introducing myself. I forgot I should call my... Role in government as well, so that someone doesn't say why the man talking about government. I, I was served as executive assistant to Dr. Emma Sawyer for four years while he was interim president. And actually, I, 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 I was part of the peace process, no me. Uh, I can talk about it. I lived that history, you know, participated in the peace process, Kotunu, the Yamasuka one, two, three, and all of that, Banjo meetings. So, and then I became Solicitor General under President Sully, a position which I chose. I could have been a Supreme Court judiciary, I could to be uh, Associate Judge of the Supreme Court or Chief Legal Advisor. I said, no, I want to be a gatekeeper. I have represented journalists a lot, uh, freeing men, Sandra Moore, in the underground jail at the Justice Ministry on Central and, and, and Ashmore Street. And she said, what do you want? I said, I want to be solicitor general. Because I want to be the, I want to be the gatekeeper to make sure there's freedom of expression. I want people to actually criticize you and not go to jail, you know, that, so that the, the, the speeches that, that people will be clapping for and the one that will make you cry will be accorded the same protection. And that I successfully did at Justice Ministry. And you don't get calls from people in government. And, but what's wrong with that speech? That speech now. They would compete for free speech. You know, uh, one close president to the president came on. You see, for instance, when I lie about the president or, or, or read the veritas, and he was really angry. I said, so? He lied, so? That speech. So if you feel as a lie, go and contact him on that radio station. Yeah, but why you can't call him the Justice Ministry? I said, the history of the Justice Ministry, even if Jesus Christ says here and call you, you'll be intimidated. This place had an underground jail. And the first day I entered our Solicitor General, I closed our underground jail and put an office there. I said, Justice Ministry, no place to be. I said, why should I call him, man? He said, yeah, but just call him. To... I said, okay, you know what, Chief, I advise you. Next time you hear somebody speaking terrible things for the president, just switch the radio off. Or tend to hear them, you hear, you listen to fun religious music, or spiritual, hear busy, hear busy, will never say anything bad about the government. But we want an open society. And he and I went to jail for speaking freely, for exercising our right of freedom of expression. And that's why I've committed my law practice number one to keeping, to protecting freedom of speech. Everybody knows, I, I've said it openly that I would. I would represent freely anybody who is arrested or sued for damages for speaking truth to power. And that power might be in government or might be strong uh, political 
interest outside government or strong business people. These people are powerful too. They are powerful too. That's why I've been going for front page Africa, different radio stations. Because I think we have to build tolerance. And tolerance is tested by a tough, tough statements against powerful people. And then you go to bed and wake up the next morning and you are okay. So that's what I've been. And so, yes, we've been participating in history. He went to university before me. We met them who are members of the university spokesman. We, our magazine, the university spokesman, was the only independent news organ in the country. So in a the way, university spokesman. Yeah. University. It was the name of your ma ma magazine. The university of Liberia spokesman was the name of the official magazine of the students, yeah. student union of the University of Liberia. And we were both, I, I used to run a, 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 an anonymous column called Curious About, and, and the people want to know. I, I used to sketch like thousands of people. The people want to know why President Thomas is so, so, so. It's anonymous. The people want to know. So we, we, we were, we got the only people who were, were New Liberia, and like and Grand Age, Grand Age. Like Grand Age was a three party paper. We we're talking the, history. Yeah, the Daily Star. A, yeah, Daily Star. All of them were connected to the three party, the right. inaugural. Yeah. So they were not talking tough things. We are the ones that people working in government who didn't like things that were happening, used to give information to. And we used to publish them in a, in a university spokesman. And they were all factual. And the motto of the the university and like breast we were even a bullet to our breast, we shall speak the truth. Even a bullet to our even breast, with, even, even with, with bullets. even yeah, even with bullets to our breast, we shall speak the truth. And we were fearless. And then, fortunately, we had a university president who promoted democratic education, Mary Anthony Brown Sherman. Uh, several times, the President will call it. Have you seen this leave letter appear on campus around five o'clock last, uh, last evening? She says, so I promote democratic education. We teach the students political science, we teach them history, we teach them everything. They have a right to exercise what we are teaching them. She was fearless too, you know. And so we had that, you know, enabling atmosphere on the university campus to actually exercise what we learned. So one of those was on April 3rd, 1978, Jimmy Carter was coming to Liberia as president. And we're not opposing the American government, but we're opposing our government's action. You know, the president has, has spent three days in Nigeria, an oil-rich oil country, but also a former British colony. And we, historically, have all been taught that we were the closest ally to the United States giving our history. And official the president will come for one hour visit, right? To three, no, three hours. Three hours to refuel his plane and then, you know, get out. Then the president declared the day a holiday. President, president Torbo, Torbo declared yeah. the day a holiday. Because President Carter was coming, was coming in for just three hours, yes. so Torbo declared the day as a holiday. We yeah. got angry. We said, no, 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 no. The day, the man spent three days in Nigeria and Nigeria did not declare holiday. He's spending three hours here, and you want to declare holiday. Holiday will affect our economy. Learning economics, and people not open businesses that day. Mm -hmm. they, so what did you do? Stand up to him? So we wrote a protest. Universal Library students opposed Jimmy Carter's visit. And then we met and said, how we do that? Who goes to city? I said, I will go to city. Our young are 22 years old. I want to sit her with a stack of papers. And we arranged that there will be two persons accompanying you, you know, who will not, even the rest you, they will not talk, but at least will come back to the command post to say the president has been arrested. So my two buddies, my two guys were the late Jim Logan and the late Ben Dooney. And we walked to sit the hall and to show the paper, especially giving it to the American uh, security officer that was the, yeah, I was around the mansion. He was assigned to the mansion. So, I was arrested first, I think. Mm -hmm. No, you were arrested first. But when I got there, I, saw, I was. So I just saw this uh, 
dark shades, security officer coming, looking at people eating. So I knew I was going to be arrested. I said, the paper not for you. I give it to, I'm giving it to the students. Then, uh, there was funny thing happened. One magistrate, a, a Mongol friend, a major associate magistrate, we're all living behind the city hall there, Prince Johnson, all of us. So I gave him one of the papers. As soon as he saw that the security arrested me, he, he dropped the paper. I always laughing. He just <laughs> dropped the paper. You know, but the thing is that, so I was arrested. Well, as soon as they said they were arresting me, I threw the paper at the AGM student. Right the way. Then they put me in the B and they go, what? Government officials should know is that students are never afraid. If you don't get children, you don't get no family, nothing. And they are idealistic. You know, it's better to talk to them. And somehow Toba understood that when we used to go to the office and we have conversation with Toba, you know, mm -hmm. he was an intellectual. He understood that he would mellow you down. So then I sat in the car and said, uh, yeah, who are you? I say I'm a student here, was a second year student, young. So go in the car and say, yeah, I'm a president today. He said, what do you mean? I say, I have a, a chauffeur, I have an aid de camp, I have two bodyguards. You were just being sarcastic. Yeah, I said, uh, all of them are well armed, and I'm in an air conditioned uh, BMW, so I'm president. Let's go. We got a police station. And Ernest Malva, right? The late Ernest Malva, he was lieutenant. He asked me a question. I was shooting back. Really? Put me in jail. Interestingly, 16 years later, Ernest Malva was my bodyguard. When I was appointed as a special counsel to prosecute those who wanted the military, but I want to overthrow the transitional government, Papa Point, and others. And I started to come back to the I've had an interesting experience our commission. As a colonel in the air drill, I was wearing an army uniform as the trial counsel. And my intelligence officer and bodyguard was Lieutenant Colonel Ernest Mulva, the same man who. He was a woman, I think. Yeah. So, so then, one day after two uh, hours in, in Fendal, I said, we're sitting on a tree waiting for our boss to come. I said, Lieutenant, I said, Lieutenant Colonel Ernest Mulva, do you know me? He said, but no council of government, we do not know council of government in this country, in 1994. I said, but I say you jailed me before you believe me. What did you for? I said, and you were the one who investigated the students who protested President Jimmy Carter's visit in 1978. He said, yeah, and one little boy there, the more was shot there. I said, I didn't worry, he said, I jailed by him. I put him by him. I said, I said, suppose I said that be. He said, no. So I described, you know that day you were wearing a, a great total environment so long sleeve. I described that. And then the guy who told him, put me in jail, I described that. So he said, oh. I said, no. I just want to say the world is actually wrong. If someone had told you and myself in 1978 that today I would be your, your boss, you probably would have insulted that person. I probably would not have believed it. That you guy was just a student. How could I be your boss? You're a lieutenant already in the police. So, this, just to give a background to the kind of things that we're doing. Okay. Today, let we me, believe let in me. democracy, peace of okay. all, we're reading, and we're trying to make our society a democratic society. Now, we place very good emphasis on the 1980 coup and the 79 rest yeah. riot and your different accounts, right. Commissioner Stewart. But <clears throat> before we go there, I wanted to ask the both of you, I mean, two, three minutes each, you can address the question. Generally, what do you think about the perception of Liberians about the progressives? Now, it depends on who you talk to. Some Liberians think, well, they did well. Other people say, what kind of well? The only thing we can praise them for is their advocacy for multi-party democracy. It's not sufficient. They destroy the country. They had the opportunity to take on, and so no progressive is, is ever going to be president yet. Their mentality, the way they understand things, everything. Is, do you think we should appreciate the progressive? Do we have heroes that we should, should be supposed to be appreciating? The two people do well. In every society, 
you know, historically, uh, the process of, of change is always difficult. And there's a saying that there can be no gain without pain. But when the pains are there, people actually get discontented, get discontented, get angry with the, the change, the, the, the change leaders. And then we see, you know, you sometimes talk about when I read, I listen to you. When when Moses was freeing the the the, the Jews and were going back to Israel, didn't they complain that it's better to be in captivity? Things were normal. Now we come, we are suffering in the wilderness. We are building a, a democratic society. We are building a peaceful society based on rule of law. That's going to be. It's going to take time. It's true that we have not had any of the change agents actually. Uh, being elected to power, and those who had control of power, who were removed were powerful forces, and they had been all through the, the years trying to say, no, yeah, Liberia, all right, and these people just brought trouble. But Liberia was not all right. Liberia was not all right. It is our change process that I got a George we are sitting, our advocacy that many people died for, you know, that got a judgment sitting in the executive mansion today. So we can say that the process that we started, our argument was correct, the objective was correct. Um, it was disturbed by the coup d'etat because I can say without a doubt that in 1983, Togo had promised that there was going to be an election in 1983. If there had been an election in 1983, it would have been to put up about as president. To win. To win, they were extremely popular, all right. So, but then the coup took place in 1980. We were angry. Many of us were angry about the coup d'état. I didn't. I could have worked in the, in the government, but I was so angry about the coup. You were angry about the coup. The, you didn't the, want a coup. I didn't want a coup. I wanted us to go to pool and defeat the true party because I knew good. Because we defeated the three party protege on the on the university campus. Mm -hmm. ESA, you know, first they are SDP. We defeated SDP for five years. Soup. We you know were part of soup. Soup was established in 1980. 1970. 1970, sorry. To change the dynamics on campus. And from the time soup was established, it won. The first uh, uh, chairman was from Nimba. Uh, the late Michael, uh, Michael G.S. Dolo, and the first tenor bearer was from Lufa County, uh, uh, Frederick Gobawali. He won. True. After five years, SDP dissolved and they formed ESA. And then after four years, ESA dissolved. Uh, and George Kier, who was our tenor bearer in 1979, went on a post. So we felt the way we defeat, and then they used to have more money than us. That the same way we defeated the pseudo tree party, the, the petty tree yeah, party, sorry. the surrogate on campus, that we were going to defeat them on the national scene. That's why that the kind of victory we wanted. So the coup was, I mean, it really stopped the progressives coming. So, in power. essence, you're saying the progressives did not know about the coup? Nope. Let me, let me no, say no, this. No, no. I, the, there were two progressive groups. I still think that the coup was a rescue mission. I may be wrong. I was not part of it outside. But you see, the Progressive Alliance of Liberia Power, led by Parker Matthews, had a midnight march on the executive marshal. At least the government reported that. Mm -hmm. And that some people were arrested with petrol bombs and all of that. And they were put in jail. I think it was in March. Mm -hmm. And Moja came up with a statement that this is infertile and imbecile. You don't march on a city government uh, at midnight. seat at midnight. You know, why would you give justification? So you have power, you have moja. moja. And we felt that the action that power took that night was not correct. So you guys were from the moja end? We were from the moja Let's end. listen to C C so, 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 yep. so, so then, but they were in jail, and the coup happened on April 11 night. And then we had our installation program for George Kier. But this is what happened. And, and I always say, like I said the other day on this radio about the so-called I mean, 
speculators here investigation of our president that anytime there is rumor the this government should immediately clarify by april in 1980 there was speculation that the true party had come up with a resolution the government to execute everybody who was in jail and there were about 90 persons in jail among them was dr george bullet the only phd from grand jail at the time oscar queer oscar jay queer a strong leader from sino county then uh, dk was a lady from nimba these were extremely popular people so the rumor was that the people would be executed the people who carried the coup d'etat were all working in the mansion do uh, uh, Cool, but everybody was working in the mansion. Now they knew the mansion so well. And the resolution, the speculation was that upon Toba arrival, when Toba arrives in Zimbabwe on the anniversary of April 14, which took place in 1979, that everybody in jail will be executed while Toba was in Zimbabwe. And that's why I believe the army did not want Toba to leave. On, because Tom was leaving on April 12th, so it was on the night of April 11th, midnight, that it could took place. So, my presumption, and I've been talking to you know, is that uh, uh, if you pair the leader of the coup, Samuel Doe to George Bullet, Kuopa to DK Wonsele, the commanding general, the second man in command in the PRC was here to Oscar Jayikuya. So, it appeared to me that. If the government had had maybe dispelled the, the rumors, said, we haven't even charged the people. We haven't tried them. We live in a civilized world. How can we execute people whom we have not tried? Okay, let's see. Still, let's hear your account. The progressive. Mm -hmm. Do you think you should be appreciated? Why? Yes. Because where we are today is not by accident. It was by sacrifice, hard, difficult sacrifice. And coming back to the coup of 1980 and its precedent, the crisis. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to the coup. I, I want to just talk about what are the progressive, we should appreciate you. Why, let, why let, did you let, 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 let me say this. Mm -hmm. We came from a line where we were inspired by others before us. There was Abba Pope, for example, who had challenged government since President King up to the time even of the coup. He didn't die. He, he passed away in 1978. Detour. Detour. You had Billy Horace who stood up against Tupman, refused to apologize to Tupman. He was my professor. He Isn't refused right? to apologize to Tupman. He stayed in jail from when Tupman uh, 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 launched the fake coup in 1955. We grew up fed with lies that there was a coup attempt against uh, an assassination attempt against uh, president tupman and it was published in a book called the plot that failed it was not until and the, the account we were given was that david coleman who was the leader of the of the progressive party at the time they call themselves the progressive party at the time was killed by President Tupman right in the BTC barracks. He and his son. He and his son, John. And one of his sons, Othello Coleman, as Othello Coleman was present, and he spoke at the TRC hearings that President Tupman stabbed his father in the chest. That's how his father died. But accounts have been written that David Coleman was killed in a sugar cane farm during an exchange of fire with government troops. Then, before soup, you had at a university, a university student, Kevin Cole, he was leader, student leader at university. At his induction speech, he challenged President Tupman. He challenged the old order. He was expelled. He was expelled from the university immediately. Had it not been for the fact that his family was well connected, he would have, he would have gone to jail. I think he had to leave the country. Then you also had the Revelation magazine, editors, Victoria Jesus Weeks, Ernestine Cassell, Neville Beth, Willa Russell. Many of these people were people from well-to-do families. But who saw the contradictions? You know, Liberia at the time 
was the economic situation of Liberia was such that you had only about 3% of the population accounting for more than 60% of the growth country's uh, gross domestic product, GDP. Growth without development. This was reflected in a book published by some uh, social scientists from Northwestern University called Growth Without Development. In a period, in the 50s to the 60s, Liberia experienced one of the highest growth, growth, growth rates in the world next to Japan, but we could show nothing for it. So these social scientists, economists from Northwestern University, wrote a book, Growth Without Development, citing the Liberian case as a classic example that growth, economic growth, doesn't necessarily mean development. Yeah, yeah. And this is what we saw during Ellen's time. She talked about growth, growth, economic growing. But what was the development? We didn't see it. Liberia was at, uh, 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 receiving a lot of money, but where the resources were going to a few people. These were the contradictions that we inherited in society. And these were the contradictions that people before us have been articulating. So we're inspired by all these people. So there was a need for change. And mind you, at the time our advocacy came into uh, active uh, being in the 70s, <coughs> Liberia was a bastion of the, what we call it? Okay, Liberia was the headquarters of the CIA in Africa. You know what that meant? I grew up at a time when, uh, when uh, the first around the U.S. Embassy used to be wire mesh. But later on, it was changed. And there was a U.S. Ambassador who was here, who died under mysterious circumstances. The information we had, like, he died in Sinko. He had a girlfriend in Sinko. He died. But that's, that's another story. But it was very clear that at the height of the Cold War, it was when President Carter came here. And he came here, actually he went to Nigeria, solicited the support of Nigeria for the deployment of the neutron bomb. And they were promoting the, what they call the neutron bomb. The neutron bomb was just supposed to kill people and not destroy buildings. And that was a horrific idea. And President Carter was coming to Liberia. He was not coming to Liberia, he was stopping and making a refueling stop yeah. at Robert's Field. Yeah. But President Talbert, Prevail insisted that he would do honor to Liberia only if he came to Liberia. He came to the capital, Monrovia. The motorcade President Togo declared a holiday. But two years later, with President Carter still in, this, in as president, the Liberian government was overthrown by soldiers trained by the U.S. military. And if you read the book of Dr. Nis Han, uh, who was here, he worked here in Liberia. He wrote a book, 200 Years of Covert and Overt U.S. Military Operations in Liberia. It tells you who were the actual planners of the coup. On the morning of the coup, there was, in fact, uh, 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 there was an American official, Perkins, a black man, who was at a mansion. You know? The morning of the coup. The morning of the coup. And if you read President Thomas' wife's account, the initial account that she wrote spoke about white hands according to what we heard. But when I read the book, that mention of white hands was no longer there. But what is interesting in the book is her Victoria Thomas' account of those people who rapped at the door when she and her husband were in there. And read the account. Mother, please open the door. Would not harm you in perfect American English. And then, when she finally, when he finally decided to open the door and the guys burst in, the first words that came out, if you not be violent, we'll kill you here tonight. It's right in her book. If you not be violent, we'll kill you here tonight. So compare the differences in speech. And at the time of the coup, with her clock, testifying before the TRC, he was Minister of National Security at the time, testifying before the TRC, said when the assassination of President Tabo was going on, he was standing at where, you probably don't remember, you're probably too young to remember where they had the tomb of the unknown soldier, where the statue of the unknown soldier. But if you come into the mansion from Sinkoa, where the road divides, right in between there, where you see the police standing, directing traffic, they had a, a statue there with a military with a soldier holding a rifle. They call the statue 
of the unknown soldier. All right. Uh, Mr. Clark, in his testimony, said that he was communicating with the assassins. With the walking talking, standing right next to him was William Jebel, who was declared wanted, Captain uh, Major William Jebel, who was declared wanted by the PRC government when it took over. So, so, uh, 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 go ahead. And he said also, on the day of the coup, the President Chief of Security, Edward Massacre, did not go to work. The President's Chief of Security? Yeah, did not, did go, to not work. go to work. And we also learned that there was there were staging points. President Togo should have been assassinated either in Bentor or here. And when he spoke at the Baptist Convention, he was to go to either to, to Bentor, they had a team there waiting for him to kill him, or he was to come to Monrovia. And we later learned through our investigations that the, the Lutheran Church compound was also a staging area because they had moved arms there with the knowledge of the hierarchy of the Lutheran Church at the time, Bishop Payne. There were arms stored there to assassinate President Talbot. It was not the progressives who were doing that. Uh, 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 Mrs. Talbot in her book says that she said to her husband, where are your friends? You don't have any friends. Mm -hmm. They come here in a mansion, they say the worst things about you. So where are your friends? Where are your friends? You don't have any friends. So, President Talbot was a man of contradictions. He was amongst, he stood out amongst the American Liberian elite as an individual, as a father, Go ahead, go ahead. As an individual who 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 who, 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 who was a Christian, but who practiced polygamy. He was a Christian pastor, a reverend, a preacher, who practiced polygamy. Evidenced by the numerous children he had outside his marriage. But what distinguished him from the others was that he educated his children and considered them equals to those who were born in wedlock to American Liberian mothers. That was the distinguishing qualifying difference between President Talbert and the rest of his colleagues. Okay, I, 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 I know we'll post on Spotlight. One of their colleagues just joined them, Joseph Fakoli. Mr. Fakoli would like to say welcome. We'll talk to you shortly. Let's begin with Stewart. Then we'll go to Fakoli on this one, then we'll come to Gongo. Now, the, the, the infamous 19... 79 restaurant there are multiple accounts of that situation and i want us to deal with this particular one the, the people a lot of librarians think look you know what back of matthew and his likes the other time i have deacon Carla here. people say back of matthew and his likes were they using their western education to outsmart the regime they wanted a cook they wanted to topple, they wanted to take over the government. But they were looking for something to use. And so when Floris Chino with the Minister of Agriculture came up with that proposal to increase the price of rice, they saw it as a perfect opportunity to topple the government. But because the government overpowered them, they made it look like it was just a regular protest they were carrying on. What do you say to that? That's not true. As I said, we were living participants of history. At the time of, in 1979, I was chairman of national affairs of the University of Liberia Student Union. On March 18, 1979, the Movement for Justice in Africa was holding a memorial, not a memorial, but anniversary rally at the Sports Commission. And a lot of people were invited. Amongst them was Mr. Bacchus Matthews. And uh, as per tradition, during our programs, we would invite other speakers and ask we ask it. Anybody represented here from the Truth Party? Come forth, we ask. No representative from the Truth Party. And uh, Mr. Bacchus Massey stepped up and announced, without any prior consultation, that on April 14th, we'll be leading a rally, a protest demonstration to protest against the proposed incre increment in the price of rice. At your program? At our program, March 18, 1979. 
at the Sports Commission. I was there. And it will receive a wide applause. Why was it receiving a wide applause? Because the economic conditions at the time were such that they were excruciating. Imagine a soldier, and I say this from the experience as a, as a non-commissioned officer in the militia who operated together, a common soldier, ordinary uh, private in the army, was earning something like about $22 a month. The, the, the proposal was to increase the price of rice from $9.50 to $15. So a soldier earning $22 a month, having to pay $15 for a bag of rice, has a family of six, seven, eight, nine, because the, 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 the family structure was such that the Ministry of Planning at the time said, in order to make it a family of four, needed to earn an income of $125 a month, due to the statistics coming from the Ministry of Planning. But you had soldiers, family of four, five, six, seven, earning $22 a month. Of course, they were irate. And when Bacchus announced this, it resonated. President Talbot decided to invite Bacchus Nazis for our discussion. And he, we also declared our support from the University Student Union for, for, to, to protest. Against to, the, to join the protest? Yes, to join the protest. So President Talbert requested Mr. Matthews to form a people's delegation to go to the mansion to explain, to discuss the issue. I led the University of Liberian student delegation to the mansion to discuss with President Talbert and his officials. The Minister of Agriculture, Florence Chinewit, was there. And she made a presentation that it was going to, the proposed increment in the price of rice was going to benefit local farmers and it was going to raise the, the income levels and that's what they were trying to do raise income levels but our argument was that to raise income levels means that you raise productivity and raising productivity was not possible using cutlasses and holes you couldn't raise productivity so most of our people were subsistence farmers we also found out that there were top government officials who were producing rice very large rice farmers and they were selling the rice on the market. President Tobo was among them. The Minister of Finance, Jimmy Phillips, was among them. And other, uh, Richie Hendricks, and other big shots. Additionally, the President's brother, Daniel E. Tobin, was the single largest importer of rice into the country. Cinco. Yeah. Yes. So if the price of rice was going to increase, the buying price was going to increase, it meant that those who were selling large quantities of rice on the market, President Tobin, yes, got local rice, you were going to uh, get higher income, but the subsistence farmer there, at that level, were making farm with who, making farm, who rice will finish before the green season even come in, they would not have benefited. They would not have benefited. That was your argument. That, that was your argument. And besides that, income level. The soldier making twenty two dollars a month. How would he afford to send the children to school, put clothes on the back? So it was affecting everybody. And we made this representation representations of President Toba. President Toba said. Okay, I hear what you're saying. Government, you will hear from the government. And we left. We never heard from government. But we heard that the price of rice was still going to increase. Our report went to the president. And at the time, the pressure was building up for the demonstration. Our report went to the president. He said, Mr. President, this thing has become explosive. And our report wrote his memoirs in the day Monrovia's Tooth Tale, 1979, published by Albert Port, and you see that account. So, he went to the president, pleading with him not to. And at the time, we had only two radio stations, ELBC and ELWA. ELWA was broadcasting only religious programs and news approved by the government. ELBC. News approved by the government. Yes. ELWA. Yes. Lena. Wow. Yes. The government will have to approve the news. Yes. Because if you put if you hear anything about Dr. Tipote, for example, or Bacchus Matthews, positive, they will come at you. They will close the station down. So that's what I meant. It was censorship. Okay. You know. So uh, 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 the thing is, the thing was at the time, so open port was between the executive mansion, President Thomas Moon, and this is in his own account, and the student union, and as well, with the, 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 the power, the progressive alliance as they were known at the time. So we received some information from top securities in the mansion. Came to us and said, look, this thing 
is 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 getting out of hand. There are people who are advocating that the government should use force, and the, a decision has been made that people will be shot. The government will use force. So we beg you, you tell your people to call the demonstration off. We went. We decided to go to see uh, Parkers Matthews. That was Dr. Sawyer. That was myself. That was Dr. Fumble and one or two others. We went down to the PAL headquarters. This was around the 10th, no, no, it was around the 11th, 12th of April or so. We went there and the police was packed. So we couldn't hold any meaningful discussions because we didn't know who was who. So the suggestion came out was that we go into the cemetery with only people that Barkas trusted and us to meet and discuss this thing. Khan Carlos said that. Yes. We went and we, we divorced the information that this is the information we received that there will be shooting on the day of the demonstration. And the best thing we could do was to call a demonstration off. Initially, Matthews was adamant. He said, no, we cannot call a demonstration off. That if we go on the streets today and people are killed, 100 persons are killed, tomorrow we'll go back and do it until the government resigns. And Fumble said to him, this is not the way to go. We don't have anything to protect these people. It's we we cannot, it's suicidal. We cannot. We have to call this demonstration off. Fumble said that. Yes. In the cemetery. So eventually, Matthew will prevail upon to call the demonstration off. But the point is, the point was, how to communicate the message. To say we're cutting it off. We're calling it off. And in fact, apparently, the government officials apparently didn't want that kind of thing to happen. Because some of them wanted to use the occasion to teach these progressives a lesson. You know? And then, Abba Port, in the day when we were still still, he was in between there, in, in, in between the government. And President Talbot said to him, he went to see President Talbot, according to his account, in Bensonville. Now, the open port was living in Cruiserville. Cruiserville is close to Bensonville. Bensonville, Bensonville. Yeah. yeah. So he went there. And President Talbot was being fed all kinds of lies. What he told open port? Open port? I hear you having a meeting with, your, with, with the boys at your home in Cruiserville, meaning the university students and all of that. I hear you meeting with the boys at your home in Cruiserville. Tissues of lies. So woman put said, what, what, what meeting with what boys? Then, at the last minute, at the very last minute, April, this was April 13th, April, the, 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 the demonstration was April 14th, in the early hours of the morning, there was no way to communicate in between. Women Port was there at the park headquarters. When the government security, they broke in fire tear gas, dispersed the people, and people started running in the, into the streets. And that's how the demonstration, because people were preparing to come to the demonstration, coming from all parts of Morovia, but people they didn't know at the time that early morning, government forces had invaded the place and had people running here. That's how it just started. That, so people started taking revenge, start tuning. The government offices, buildings, and anything they saw. Let's hear Farcoli say, come. Farcoli, welcome to the show. I, I, I didn't know you were progressive. I, I didn't know yeah. that. <laughs> that yeah. You want to know about sports, yeah, sports, yeah, I want to know about football. I mean, these people are spread up all over the place. Farcoli, yeah. how are you? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, uh, good to have you, man. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm a member of LPP. Okay. I'm a funny member of LPP. Really? And if you look at the document, I signed one of those that signed the article of incorporation. Wow. About 1984. In fact, I led to my dismissal from the LPRC. The LPRC? Yeah. On a, on a, so the thing started way back? Yes. Uh, so you were working with LPRC? Yes. But when you signed the LPP document to form LPP, yeah. don't dismiss you? Yeah, that was being a woman, Barrio, Sarah's Barrio's father. When J. Barman signed, one Richard Gates. From, uh, but your two you were brave. You were brave because uh, it was like a mass meeting that was held. The MD at the time, uh, editor Johnson Francis, said everybody that working with a piazza shoe uh, take a NDP or membership card. NDP or membership card. Yeah, I stood. I said no. It was National Democratic Party. Party yeah, yeah, I know the NDP. Uh. So I stood. I said look, uh, the personnel manager is not saying that. If you don't work, they fire you. If you steal, they fire you. If you don't come to work, they fire you. 
example, partisanship. Based on that, there was one morning I was just sitting on the morning when they had a meeting over the weekend. I saw the lift. Uh, they did, uh, well, the NSA a guy that used to be around. He came, yeah, he came to me and said, Look, you, you are from Lofa, why should you follow these people to go against? And Kekla Koto is the chairman for NDPL. But I was this man, Bongo said he came, uh, and uh, me in my uh, letter. And the guy said to me, that you have to leave. If you don't leave, we'll drag you. Uh, after you have low, you eat nothing but a red banana. When they take you from here, I mean, you'll not survive. And, and, and that was it. And you, so, and you left? Yeah, I left. And, but what we did, we sued the government. We sued the government. Our lawyer was uh, considered, considered a trauma death. He was our lawyer. How did the case go? Well, the case traveled all the way until 1987. Okay. When Nimba, the people from Nimba and met in a meeting. The late Tassin to Ukara said, where the government was against Nimba people. Uh, he talked about his man, Jay Bahman's son, who was a member of the Labrador National Party, also. Okay. Then two, two Harum members, so in this case, and the kids were taken away from the court. From the court. They were harmonized. Okay. I think they paid all like, almost like 40 months. 40 dollars? 40 months. Or oh, 40 months. And now, pay for yourself. you were from Lofa at that time. Yeah. Harry Fomba Mulba was the vice president from Lofa. Yeah. Kekula Poto, very influential president from Chair Lofa, Lofa, party chair president. Chair. Yes. Why didn't you join the NDP or but you chose to go the progressive way? Well, my thing started back in uh, 1968. I was live born, living around the barrack. I'm turning to Australian school, Moral Australian school, when the president told us there that all the ambassadors uh, are, are doing a great job. Only one ambassador was against the government, and that was Heron Boyman Family Senior. Boyman Family's father? Yeah, so he was. Arrested uh, among the ambassadors, and uh, you are taking the post packet. So, in the morning, we used to go on a tree, they would bring the man and give him 25 latches. You're joking? Yeah, we were living before. Then, most besides the school that I was in, the poor in the street for almost like two days were blacked out. Family is a rat, family is this, family is a traitor. At that time, we have Augusta F. King as a minister. Education at that time. So, you know, then uh, the students from the University of Liberia, I remember they all were troop to the court. And some of us were not even why they were good, they were going to stand around. So the thing started building up from there. Then the, the movement of Kansas in Africa were in high school, 1973, they started. Uh, they used to have a meeting at CW. We all begin to go there to see what we to go on besides that. Uh, even right here at Benson Street, uh, Frank Tower House, you couldn't pass Frank Tower House after. Why? Yeah, uh, because <laughs> like, like in front of the house, I mean, I was right before you got to Benson Street. Uh, Benson Street, yeah. Clay Street, Clay Street. Clay Clay. Benson Street. You couldn't even pass that because it never worked. Protein. Amen. Pro President yeah. Protein. Yeah. So you can pass. Yeah, yeah. You can pass by one round of coming car. We yeah, used to, one round of coming car. Bullet, we used to call him Bullet Gay was referee. Was jailed just by passing there after 730. Jail mm -hmm. for uh, passing. To so you go to the where I said no. I said, I don't know. What's your account of the 79 rest riot? What do you remember? Well, uh, before 1979, uh, we were in Sioux. Every time there was a meeting on Gary Street, we would go there, uh, back of our view, up high. But then, the, my uncle was in the army then, making as low as, it was $17, and later on, it went to like $22. Uh, as a student, we all live in there. We have to sell, even market run. 
the prank call. Oh, well, I mean, it's it gone. Then the government decided to increase the rights. The progressive line, I mean, all have been said here, said that uh, that was too much for the mm. liberal people. Mm -hmm. And if it, and some of us at soup uh, wrote the re leave this, and some of us took it to the battery, telling the army guys to say, look, uh, any demonstration, don't fire at your people. It was me and the late ambassador, Erin Sede, who died uh, in Morocco, your Liberian ambassador mm -hmm. to Morocco, yeah. So we all went there and we were from the area already. So we talked to our people. Mm -hmm. If you saw the, on the day of the demonstration, uh, only uh, the police honor, they did value them to fire the demonstrator. Mm -hmm. I remember we were climbing the hill when uh, in front of information ministry, it was me, Gabriel Tabe, and Kibiki Sano. But uh, one of our classmates, uh, George Appleton, was a police guard too. He the one said, he said, oh, Fako, you move, Sano, you move. The next guy that got online, finally, then said, use the Winchester and find the guy. So the whole thing went loose. He died. Yeah. Right in front of him. Yeah, right in front of him. Then uh, a government car, if you were a fire, one or two government cars were passing. We stung the car, we took the guy to JFK. Who was on shade or that? Benson Bar. So you can see that this country, they were burning over something that was happening. Uh, so, so the 1979 rest riot was not basically that the progressive wanted to topple and take over the government, yeah. but they were advocating and fighting to ensure the price of rice does not go up. Indeed, uh, it was not like uh, we from Moja Anchor, we really want to go to the election. We really want to go to the election. Councilor, uh, Councilor uh, Gongolo, let's even, hear it. Even, even Pa, Pa was the first uh, pressure group to actually uh, established a political party in January mm. 1980. Mm. So they too were prepared to go to the election. Both Moja and Power were prepared to go to the election. So, you know, if 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 the coup had not taken place, there could have been a smooth transition in 1983. Right? Do, 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 do would not have participated no. in the election in 1983. No, do would not. Yeah, so yeah. The, two, the two terms would have been over? Is that what you mean? No, I'm saying Tobin. Tobin. Oh, Tobin oh, was okay. president. I'm sorry. I'm Tobin sorry. Was I'm sorry. Yeah. And he announced to the true party, you better reorganize yourself. Okay. So, so the, I'm, I'm sorry. They, I, I, there was a disconnect. Yeah. But, 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 but the problem, I'm, the, the point I'm raising, so had the election, if the election would have taken place in 1983, three. the incumbent president, Tobin, would not have run. Okay. Right. He I see why he, you said. He declared, he, he declared that. Mm. And then he told the true party, you better reorganize. So Tripoli Party had a Basa Quadrano Congress. Yes. In you know because yeah. Tobar told them I'm not going to run. I'm not going to run. So now they started organizing themselves and they started bringing in some indigenous young intellectuals like uh, the late Frederick Chero was I think secretary or chairman of the Youth Wing Group. You know secretary of the Tripoli Party. Yeah. The the they started. Started, they started, you know, they started forming. Uh, Emmanuel Shaw. Yes. In fact, Emmanuel Shaw predicted what happened on April 12th. He gave a speech in 1979 at the MCSS, he was the commencement speaker that year, and said, if the true party does not take care, there is going to, there is going to, uh, there was going to be a cataclysmic, that word he used, there was going to be a cataclysmic change. He said there was no way to stop. Emmanuel Shaw. Yes. The same Emmanuel Shaw. The same Emmanuel Shaw. He said there was not, they would know to stop the change. The tree party must do something, otherwise then there would going to be a cataclysmic change. You know, so so the the, 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 the society was actually boiling over. Like we research that I tell government people today, like they can't be explained. Nothing looks new to you. So you're thinking also oh, they can fire people because you jump for these things are Still happening, because right? I'm thinking that these yeah. things this happen thing even happened. way back in the 70s, and, and they, and they, yeah. they are still being <laughs> repeated. Exactly. When you work for the government, by the time you you say you want to join another party, yeah. then you got your job got to go. We will come to steal. I want to know what put two of you in. What took two of you to jail? But Gonglo, 
different accounts. We only hear, we, we can only read that. I mean, I've not read any of that account, but I think I heard from somebody that in 1979, hundreds of students were killed during the race riot. Do you have the name? Do you still remember the name of some of your colleagues who died in 1979? Well, I'm right. asking all of you, still all of you. Yeah, right after the demonstration, it was like Saturday, by uh, Monday morning, uh, Comrade Mulva, uh Bali came to me and said, look, we need to go to Grace Brandner, uh, if you understand funeral home to see your gun and Bali. We got to Grace Brandner funeral home. The woman said, are you brave? I said, yes. We got there, we saw, more than 50 bodies. But we, I mean, the woman said, look, you're, you're not gonna make it out until I, I really embalm it. Because he said, if you want to know from, from somebody who got killed by one shot, you step on the leg, maybe you'll see, but on the side, you're not gonna fight you. Okay. We saw a lot of bodies, and even in my person, I told you, yeah. what have you had information? Yeah, it's one conglomerate about you, and, and they're on to steal. But the thing is that... Do you remember any of your colleagues who died? I do not remember. No. Aaron Nimsey was shot. No. Yes. Oh, I remember that. Aaron Nimsey was shot, but... You say, how you going? Aaron Nimsey. Oh, she was a woman. Aaron. Yeah. Aaron, Aaron Nim Nimsey. Okay. That's why, you know, I didn't mention her name because she was not part of the demonstrators. Mm. She was just leaving the university campus. She was our colleague. We were all living in the dormitory. Remember and, she, and she was a member of soup. She was going down to Jalastan, and she was killed by a stray bullet. Wow. She was not even, she was a very quiet lady. So she was killed by a stray bullet. At least we remember that. But he just talked about one funeral having 50 dead bodies. We claim that at least 200 persons were killed on that day. The government admitted 40. The government said 40. We have 40 who killed. <laughs> Fakoli said he saw more than 50. Right. Yeah. You people were claiming 300, 200, no, 200. but the no. government officially said 40. 40. Uh, yeah. Mind you, uh, yeah, yeah, just, just you know, my Fakoli, you won't get, you won't get to see what the market is. And I want, and I want to know, but Grace Brunner, that is to just strike up, had another set of bodies. And there were also some in the in the uh, JFK yard, beside the ones. And, and interestingly, uh, uh, we had some uh, comrades who were doctors at JFK. Uh, Dr. Benson Bar was one of them, the late Dr. Benson Bar. Yeah. He was one of those. Yeah, Deacon Carroll told the story about how Dr. Bar relocated the fabricated clinic there. It was a plan that you would set up there. All of our companies that would get wounded would bring them there, all those kind of things. So he was, he was, okay, so, but at least you got one of your colleagues that, that you can remember were killed. Because we, we are hearing hundreds of students and I'm thinking, what are some of the names of these students? But you see, when you say students, they're not necessarily students mm -hmm. from the university. Yeah, yeah. There were other students, students, elementary as well. What took you to jail, still? You mean uh, after the red riot? Mm -hmm. so How many times did you go to jail? Several times. Oh, really? My first experience in prison was... You not... face the mark, or you pull it to you. I want, I want the librarian people to hear you. I, I, I didn't go to jail April 14th. Okay. I went into hiding in fire studio. I was staying at PBT. You scary man. Let's listen to Siwa's <laughs> account. I'll come to you. <laughs> Go ahead, Siwa. My, my first, my, my first uh, uh, jail experience was uh, 19, December 1974. As way back in 1974, you went to jail. Yes. Yeah, give us and, an account. And I'll tell you why. It was because I was uh, carrying an announcement around calling for a protest march in support of the revelation editors who have been detained. Womanport had been sued by President Tobert's brother, Stephen Tobert was the Minister of Finance. And he was found guilty. And the Revelation magazine, Victoria Weeks, uh, Neville Best, Robert Russell, and Patrick Burroughs, and all of that, they wrote an article in the paper and I think that article was written by Victoria Wicks, H. Abbott, talking about the injustice of the system. And for that, they were summoned by the Supreme Court and fined $5,000 each. And so they opted not to pay the $5,000 but prefer to go to jail. And the late Judge Emma Shannon Walser was several. We walked from the Temple of Justice that day, singing all our patriotic songs, the, 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 the Lone Star Forever, the national anthem and all of that, and marched with 
them all the way to the prison where they were incarcerated. So then we decided to organize a demonstration, protest demonstration, to apply pressure on the government to have them released. That was when I was uh, picked up along with a colleague, uh, Henry Harmon, were broadcasting the the, 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 the the Minister of Justice at the time, Lawrence Morgan, had issued instructions in his office that they should send a military truck to run down the taxi in which we were riding brought during the broadcast. What you still run down the taxi? What do you mean to, to run to hit it and run over it? Yes. What? And there were two Are you serious? There were two ladies. My crowd of girls at the time. One of them was Caroline Mumbo. She was Caroline Dean Marjo Mumbo. We were all living in the same neighborhood, close with the, with the, uh, 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 on Robert Street, Nipple Street, Robert Street, and Batu Dolly. They ran with speed to the house to tell my family to get to me to get off the street because the Minister of Justice, they heard the Minister of Justice giving the order that the military truck should run us down. But at that time, I just decided to take a break for lunch. I went to my, I went home and that's where I got the news. Well, on my way back on the street, the agents were, I didn't know the agents were already following me. And so they just picked me up and picked up home and took us to the police station and detained us there were in detention when the demonstration was held. And I remember very well, the late Arthur Somerville came, to the, came by the police station, the police cell where we were, in a state of excitement. He said, they were shooting, but they fired blanks. And he had a couple of the, 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 the spent cat, you know, shots. They fired blanks. So why were there? They brought in Conan Kaisu. In the cell in which we were, Henry Hammond and I, and the orders have been given to given to send us to Belayala. But what I didn't know at the time was that Henry Harmon was a half brother of uh, one Daryl Gardner. He used to be in the police force. He was killed during the during the war. But Daryl Gardner and was a brother to Tillman Gardner. Tillman Gardner was deputy director of the police. So they had a connection, their family connection. So to send me to Bella Yala with us sending Harmon would not have would not have been something good. No. So, so they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed. So because of that, but immediately after Colonel Kaiser were brought into the cell, a few minutes afterwards, they took him out the next minute, a police officer came and said, Look, you carry Colonel Kaiser to Bella Yala. At the time, Charles Julu was a captain in the police force. General Julu. The same that led Julu. He was a captain in the police force. So we were detained there in the, in, in the cell for about 10 days or so in the cell before we were finally released. So that what was, was your second day? And following my detention then, because at the time, I was working at, with the Ministry of Finance as a customer officer. You were, you were working with the Ministry of Finance and doing all those things? Yeah, I was fired as a result of that. I was the, the, uh, rolling down. A regional goodies were all trained as customs officers, and I was sent to the security section. And, and, and Roland Dunn is a judge. Jo they seen George Roland Dunn. Regional goodies is general Julie Bayer. You asked me, we, we, we were all trained together. I was fired by Stephen Tobber, who was the Minister of Finance at the time. So that was my first experience, jail experience. Second, uh, I was uh, 75 briefly when Kissinger. Okay. 74, 75, you went to jail. Yeah, 75 at the time I was at university. And, and, uh, and then 78, yeah. Tiawan and myself. Tiawan, you and Tiawan. Yes. Then 79, we were charged with treason. So you went back, back to back, you were just going to jail. Yeah. But the treason was the biggest one. Yeah, the biggest charge. 1979. Treason. What yeah. did you do? <laughs> we were accused of being responsible. I was placed on a wanted list, 5,000 uh, uh, reward. That was me, that was Sam Jackson. Uh, uh, Oscar Williams. The government announced a 5,000 bounty yeah. for yes. anybody who was showing you. On posters. Dustin Wolokoli. Like, oh, we're all on posters. So at the time, we were having a reorganization.
Constitutional Congress of the Liberian National Student Union. But what did you do for that? What, what did you do? Because we expressed support for the demonstration. I didn't participate in the demonstration. We were at Cuttington holding the, the, the reorganization of I Congress. Participated. He participated. We, we had Congress in town because all of us wouldn't go. So those of us who were directly, because I was a, a member of the interim executive committee of the Liberian National Student Union in the reorganization process. That's the only call he was also, he was a uh, 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 president of the Liberian, uh, 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 also, you know, the Liberian Student Union. He had gone to attend a student congress in Togo, and on his way back, he was accompanied by a two representatives, one from the All Africa Student Union and one from the International Union of Students. They were all arrested again. One was Alexander Zharikov. They were foreigners. Yes. And the other was Ravan Kone from Senegal. They were arrested and detained. We were arrested. We, we were, when we came from Cardington, we decided to lay low and see what was going on and make contact with our other comrades to see what was happening. And what we learned that people were in hiding, people had been killed and all of that. So Omen Port came by and said, look, I would advise that you people turn yourselves in, but write the president a letter requesting that you will not be harmed in transit to turn yourself over and that you'll be given a fair trial. And we did write that letter. The late John Conway was out in hiding at the home of one of my cousins, Mira Best. She's about Kenneth Best's sister, Mr. Best's sister. That's why we're hiding in Pinsville. Community Wizard and I. You're a Community Wizard? Yeah. They see you, Senator Wizard. They see you, Senator Community Wizard. He was oh, also we are, we are all trying for treason. So, we were there, and then uh, we did a letter, John Conway, the late, who was chairman of the, became chairman of LPP later on. He typed the letter and gave it to Owen Port. Owen Port delivered the letter to the president. The president responded and said, yes, okay, we agree to the conditions. How come Port was so influential like that? The woman was an advocate. From the 1920s. For, for, from the 1920s. He was respected. Abapur. Abapur. He didn't have money, but he was respected. He was a writer, a critic. He was well respected. So, I was woman port. And he came back and said, the president has agreed, and you should turn yourselves in. So, we were escorted to the mansion that morning by woman port, Dr. Sawyer, Reverend Tomo E. Reeves, Bishop Brown, the late Bishop George Brown. Um, somebody else, I don't remember. Were you still afraid when they were carrying you? Uh, uh, afraid of what? I was not afraid. We just wanted to see what was going to be the outcome. And then you went to Bella Ella? No, I didn't go to Bella Ella. They, 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 they took you to Post Tucker? No. 79, I went to Post Tucker, but it was a different period. It was 84. So John Stewart, you were always going to jail, man. You were, you. I, I don't know. Well, we stand up for what you believe. Yeah. You, there, there are attendant risk. You stand up for what you believe. You prepare to die for what you believe. Then you can take all of those. Okay. Let me let me ask. You, I'm about to open the telephone line now because I've been having you two solid hours. Let and let me begin with. Uh, let me begin with you. Let me go to Stewart again. I'm, okay. Yeah. You already have his five calling now. Of all you did, all the advocates, some of you went to jail. Jerwan went to jail. Stephen went to jail. Faculty and National went to jail. But you were advocate. All of you taught. Did you think Liberia would have been the way it is today? Are some of the very things you fought for yesterday still happening? And why do you think they're still happening? Well, before I go through that, let me just... Tell you, uh, people believe uh, progressive in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, everything happened, the progressive, it was progressive, mm -hmm. and abroad. Mm -hmm. um, the coup took place, uh, if you look, I mean, globally, the, the Cold War won. When President Talbot went to China, we were giving $30 billion loan for the erection of the summer. And those still by the Chinese government. Uh, I don't think the other father really loved that. 
again when he spoke at a non-aligned meeting in India, where he said, uh, Liberia would not be one side. When he spoke about the proletariat, that they needed independent, they should be country on their own. All the Ghana team, Palestine, Palestine, like yesterday. All the Ghana team mm. was over. And, and, like and then, the and at the height of the Cold War, Liberia was the Omega Tower that you saw in Pinesville. It was not for navigation purposes. It was about to collect by intelligence. Well, let me get so, right to that. It was to guide the nuclear submarines. Now you have the global positioning system, but the Omega Tower was to flash to communicate with the submarines around the globe. Around the globe. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I wanted to know what are some of the things that happen way bad that's still happening. And when you, if I mean, each of you sit every day, you're listening to radio and all these things. What comes to your mind? But before you answer, somebody just sent me a text. Say, Good morning, Clarence. Comrade Nelson saw the student council president of the small junior high school called Louis Community in Gardnersville got killed during the April 14, 1979 demonstration. It said Nelson saw. Somebody's writing, say one Nelson saw. He was student council leader. He died. He was shot. Now, yes, Gonglo. Today, are some of these things still happening? When you see them happening, if they are happening, do you think, well, there was no need why we advocated us? Yes? No, no, we don't feel that way. We are not out of the woods. It's true. It's not the guru, right? But, you know, when you see people like us, like me, trying to be president, I'm saying it looks like, you know, you just keep advocating for others to do uh, why they don't have the preparation and and and, and orientation to do is hard, mm -hmm. and that's why you see me as a different presidential aspirant. It's built upon the past of standing up for what you believe. I always say to people, all of us here, we can eat roasted cassava and roasted planting and drink water and feel happy about it. We live within the scope of our income. That's what we are. So if you see me going, crossing rivers, cross uh, going on monkey bridges, going on terrible roads, living, I'm accustomed to that because of my upbringing in the progressive movement that we have to work for the general upliftment of society. Many times we laugh. We, you know, we, we don't get excited about things we see them because we've seen them many times through our history. There are people today who Young people will see tomorrow living in abject poverty. We saw Jimmy Scott, for example, here. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Scott, uh, as a young lawyer, we went to his office with a, 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 a guest from Human Rights Watch. We were talking about human rights. What do you call human rights? As Minister of Justice. He said, I don't know what, what do you call human rights. Okay, out of my office. What do you call human rights? In 1985, I was stripped naked here. What about my rights? So he died in a way he died. We've seen people when they are in power, enjoying power, they, they can disregard the rights of all other people. They can think that that power will be in there forever. We have seen people from Tory Party in our lifetime. We have seen people from NDPL. We have seen people from MPP. We have seen. And so as people are not guided by history, that's why they keep misbehaving. And it is natural. No plum remains up, get ripe, ripe, and remains there. Once it get ripe, it will dry. And this Liberia here, it's a different country. <laughs> I want a country, I usually tell people, if you don't know Liberia, you're not living, you can't be our president. And we're the only one can say, I come and go. And we understand that. I come and go. And people here, nobody expected, even we ourselves, honest, Misunderstood the people's readiness for participation in a uh, demonstration. To the family said, Boy, we didn't know the people were ready, masses were ready. So the water can be still on tap in this country. 
Don't mind all the people with their placards. Go and say, oh yeah. Then we see, even just recently, 2019 election, 19 senators, including the current president pro tem, pledged support to the vice president as a candidate to the Parker. You remember? He's to the president pro tem. In Liberia, what you see is different from the reality, most often politically. So in 1979, President Tomo, government was boasting that Liberia was the most peaceful country. No coup had taken place. We had people, investors should come here. Not knowing the water was still on top, but was actually boiling under. And that's how Liberia is. It, it, you know, leaders must be guided by that, think and do the right thing, because the people always know when things are wrong. Still, do you think all your advocacies were in vain? These things are still happening. People are still being dismissed because they did fall with the ruling party. Not just this government. It's been happening for years. Well, let me just say this. You want to move it back small? Just, just move it close to yeah. You know, uh, at the time I uh, started off advocacy, I was very young. Just while well, leaving my teens, I had thought that the change for which we were fighting, I had thought it, were, it would have unfolded in my lifetime. But you see, the process of change is not an even process. Mm. It goes about sometimes uh, slowly, sometimes with terrifying speed, then slows down again. But what were those conditions against which we struggled and which we still struggle today? First of all, if you look at income inequality, in income inequality is still rising. You still have a very you still have a very small number of persons making a lot of money. And the difference between they and those who are the bottom is increasing every day. And this was the problem we saw way back. We saw uh, that a lot of people didn't have access to education. Mm -hmm. still it's still the same today. In northwestern Liberia, which includes Lofa, Bapolo, all those places, 40% of the women have never been to school before. Those are all statistics that still today. You have Children who are supposed to be in school. I don't have the percentage there, but if you go to the Liberia Demographic Health Survey recent report, you will see we are in big trouble. Infant mortality, infant and maternal mortality rates are still high. These are things we complain of. These are things we talked about. Access to education, in fact, is even more difficult now than it was a few years back. Our public schools were outsourced to private, profit-making entities, this bridge. We were educated by Liberian teachers. Many of them didn't have the, the, the high qualification, masters and PhD, but they were committed, they were dedicated. And they taught us. And we are their products. We had teacher training schools. My mother was a lifelong teacher. From... Uh, My father was a teacher too? Yes. So, why is it that we are not training teachers? 12 years of the United Private Government. Show me one teacher training institute that was re revitalized. Show me one high school that was constructed in Monrovia. How many high schools do you have in Monrovia? Look at the population of Monrovia. How many high schools do you have? Besides the G.W. Gibson School, which is, which is now attended by students from outside of central Monrovia. You're talking about government high schools. Public, I'm talking about public, public schools. High schools yeah. Public schools. Even in the public schools, how much support? You know? So education now is like uh, profit making. Schools are established mainly for profit making. And this should be the primary responsibility of government is to educate its citizens. So these are things that we struggle against and still don't have. Agriculture. We talk about agriculture. Look what percent of our budget going to agriculture. We say agriculture should be the mainstay of the economy, is the, is the, is the backbone, is the driver. But how much do we commit to agriculture? Less than 2% of the budget is committed to agriculture. 
So these were things that we struggled against. And all of this, because increase in productivity will mean increase in, uh, 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 will mean a better livelihood for our people, especially those in the rural areas, and creation of jobs. Corruption, talk about corruption. In 1980, 17 government officials were put to the poll and executed publicly for rampant, for rampant corruption. What do we have today? Big part corruption? It, because in those days, goes to say that rampant, the joke was not rampant, the word is rampant, but it was a rampant corruption. This one, the corruption we see now is working on corruption. People washing the cars with beers. No, champagne. With champagne, washing the vehicles with champagne and all of that. What is such? What, 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 what is that? Isn't that madness? People here cannot eat. A lot of people here, even in my neighborhood, they don't cook. Only on Sundays they can afford to go to the market and buy a few things, otherwise they are living on Kobo. Is that the way it should be? These are things we talk about. And the worst today, the worst today. So, so the struggle continues. The struggle continues. In the cause of the people, the struggle yeah. continues. I have three members of the progressive here, Joseph Farcoli, uh, Tiawonse Gonklo, and of course, uh, John Stewart, they're here. And they, they think that everything they fought for 30, 40 years ago are the same issues we're still battling today. Liberians, let's participate on the show now. Our number is on Facebook. If you are outside the country, OKFM OK 99.5 and OKTV, OK you can call us. Better still, in country, call us on 777 0555 and 5. They have their own size of the story. D. Carlos was here the other day. Hello. Hello, Clarence. Yep. This is uh, Timothy Paulus. I call from Monrovia. Paulus, let's hear you. Yeah, something that we, the, every time you bring the progressive and the, the, all the history size, all of the events and, and, and situation, I don't hear people talking about the, the one week or two weeks after the after the 1980 coup when the tech team government officials were killed, were executed. Please ask the progressive what are, what are the what advice did they give the military people? Did they did they advise them against you know you killing those right. people? Okay. Or, or or what? What was their, 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 their what was their say in, 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 in that? Okay. Thank you, Paulus. The weeks after the whole coup. Did you advise the military not to kill these people or what? Hello? Yes, uh, Clarence. Yep. Clarence and Kirtilus told me, and I joined the conversation uh, from my Nukitan resident. Yep. Look, uh, let me say good morning to the, the guests. I listen to them carefully when they're going through the history and their own um, participation and you know, always with regards to that we were found. But look, I always like to appreciate the role play by the progressive you know, in this country because I believe that their, 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 their contribution to Liberia must be celebrated. But I clearly follow the conversation on yesterday and then uh, when more Ali friends were that they did not set up the role map. I agree with all of the good things that they did. But no, Clarence, the reason why today Liberia is like this is because the progressive fought for social justice, mm -hmm. economic empowerment, mm -hmm. uh, multi-party democracy, which we are enjoying today. But it did not need a clear roadmap that after fighting for this, what are we want what we want to see? The campus has a rash Yeah. I want to ask the to judge we are reaching today, mm. how can it be written in oh. terms of rules and the you. development Thank as well? You. Thank you. Hello? How are you? How are you? This is Joseph Sayer. Yes. Yes. Sayer, let's hear you. I've been following carefully the discussion with the progressive. I think that why is it true that we appreciate that role play? They play a very capital role in fostering the issue of multi party democracy in Liberia. Mm. But I think what it is fair short of is uh is the issue of structure we didn't put into place the structure that were being set that they will follow constantly roadmap and structure because once you have a structure in place obviously it will leave the stage the structure will remain in place and it will continue to live on 
Mm -hmm. And I think they were the first shots. So what we can, what the, I think the, 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 the progressive can do, so in fact, the, the has a good plan for this country, is to recalibrate and strengthen their bases and make sure that, that some of those issues, like uh, 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 Palestine was saying, some of the issue of uh, welfare and other and other uh, social 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 issues of the people. Can okay, sir. But the people themselves were divided. Uh, they have power. They have moja. You know, I'm thinking why they couldn't just come together. Hello. Hello, Mr. Clarence, and hello to the progressives in studios. Yeah. Well, my name is Ali Silla, and this morning I call from Somalia Drive, the Alumunia factory. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank them so much. I think uh, yesterday we had a debate between me and Mo Ali mm -hmm. about progressive and the programs of the progressive. Uh, but I think today he says that uh, the progressive didn't have any roadmap. Uh, you know, I was making the case that they had a roadmap, but it was a budget because of gate crashes. And I think what the Progressive Institute did today, they just give you a, a blueprint of their roadmap and it, they dismissed the argument, uh, the anti thesis of Mo Ali. <laughs> I think it's right. <laughs> I, think, I think it's very clear now uh, that we need to honor them and, and pay homage to them for their contribution, uh, what they have done, they have suffered for our country, the transformations of our country uh, for better society. I think this is what they have done over the years. And we, admirers of the progressive, we were not there when they were doing their advocacy, but history of all ways, history always tells us their role, and we have read over the years about their role. We pay homage. I want to say to them, uh, big, big up to them. And we honor them, we respect them. I think we clearance, I think we need to do a program, a national program on honoring our heroes because the progressive are our heroes. Okay. Because you know, like you we don't have a lot of heroes. These are our heroes in studio today. We really really in the past, you know, past leaders of the progressive, they are all our heroes. We really need to honor them. So at least if you go back into countries where revolutions were happening, those who are leading those revolutions, they were honored. You know, after the July 26th of, uh, of, of the movement in Cuba, uh, the people all know Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, and Che Guevara. If you look at Steve Bigo International Airport in South Africa, they are all know. If you look at Mandela, they are all know. More, more okay, they are all know in their country. Uh, Thomas Sankara, they are all know in their, in their country because the progressive admire them for the injustice that were done in their country. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like thank you. A, a, pro, a progressive board. Thank you. Let's go here and talk to Frank Gibson from Paris. Then we'll come back for Mr. Steele and others to uh, answer some of your questions and then we can wrap up. Hello? Good morning, Clarence, and good morning to your studio guests. Uh, one thing I pick up from the from, from their explanation was if President Toma remained in power in 1983, he would have taken part in the elections. I think that would have been a smooth transfer of power. Mm -hmm. Why then did it uh, 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 encourage people to go for coup? So I think that was a dangerous uh, space. But they said they didn't know about a coup. Exactly. Yeah, I know, but they were part of the program. Uh, they, they were just demonstrating for other things that would have put, uh, that, that, that potentially caused the coup to, uh, to happen. Oh, so so your 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 yeah. your point is if they knew they wanted to participate in the 1983 election, they should have not. They should not even have protested in the first place. Yeah, because the, 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 I think that's the national government or somebody said they knew it. Uh, Thomas already said that you were taking by the elections. So yeah, that would have been a, a, a better chance for them. Said, 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 since they wanted a smooth transfer of power. Okay. Now, uh, la and last year, before I grabbed the line, Clarence, uh, today we see that uh, those advocates who go in the street to demonstrate, they are then paid by, by, by politicians. Because in order, in all, all of the organizations who have uh, entered this particular studio talking about this issue, none of them have never said that they were influenced by uh, politicians in power. Uh, maybe if, they, if, if that happens, maybe they can clarify that. But today we see people who are demonstrating against government. They are the influence for politician, pay by politi uh, politician, and they are there. Do, do they sometimes have conversation with some of those boys who are now there, carrying on the same path they were uh, uh, they were in before? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me go to Fakol. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the call. Both of them are saying that uh, we the progressive without our roadmap. That is a blatant lie. When the coup took place, the Liberal National Student Union 
issue of position statement that read by uh, Wissa, Kamele, Kamele Wissa, at the executive mansion. When he advised... Sir Thomas J. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. But your issue statement. Yeah, yeah issue statement. When he advised that uh, the government did not go back to the old days, though they should stop Ryan Mercedes, the government should pay attention to the citizens. The government should put more money in the schools. Uh, the government should, those who have heart issues, should start. What do you said? That Kamala Wieser is saying, was saying that they should ride with Mercedes. I mean, that Mercedes uh, was right on. Kamala Wieser said a whole lot of things. Uh, Wieser was arrested. The first thing he was put on was arrest. That no one should sell food to him. No one should visit Wieser. The next thing that they did, Wieser was put into prison. It was the lack of Wensen, Aaron Zuo, uh, Rao Smoke, and said, look, we took power. This kind of thing was happening in this country before to redeem the Labrador people. He had to release a visa. At the university campus, President Harris went there and we were sent. He took a finger and put it on the ground. He said, Oh, yes, I'm going to release visa. From today, you will know the meaning of military government. Hmm. Yeah. It never took too long. He so went. He saw. Yeah, yeah. He put a finger there, like, hey, you know. Today, you know the military government. And when Wesley came in in his liturgy with Fiti, and the student followed Wesley. Do what best in a court. But then the thing started. It was those people that advised, I mean, if they are listening to what also was saying, listen. What was happening in Canada? What happened? Most of the mistakes. And the progressive was never part of the coup. I remember when the coup took place, my uh, brother in law, Joseph Kekula, was assigned at a match and killed him like 2 o'clock in the morning that Saturday. The little group of guys came and stood in the match. He was, he was then an SS man. He was an SS man assigned there. To me, but in my little way, young man at that time, some of us are happy. But by four o'clock in the morning, I went to Dr. Swire House. I told him, I said, Oh, they are killed, talk about. But Dr. Swire was never happy. He said, Look, better food, you all will find a group of people springing up. So you are never happy. Okay, yeah. So. See what let's hear you. Then we wrap up now. We Council of Gunflow right here. If you read the book, 200 years of uh, U.S. covert and covert military operations for Liberia, mm -hmm. you will get to appreciate the fact that it was not a progressive stage, the coup. As we said, Liberia, at the time the coup was staged, this was during the height of the Cold War. And Liberia, the Liberian government was a protégé of uh, U.S. foreign policy. And they feared that had a elections taking place in 83, the true party would have been voted out of office. Togat had uh, called him a, a promoted non-alignment. Like uh, my comrade faculty said, he established their relations with China he brought in, uh, he got a loan to build the, the stadium. But well, what was most excellent to the Americans and probably to Firestone was that he built a rubber factory in Banga. And I'm saying this because I'm a rubber farmer. I used to be. My father was. Price of rubber under Firestone have fallen so bad. Most rubber farms went into, uh, they were not being farmed anymore. 
But when the rubber factory built by the People's Republic of China under the rubber corporation of Liberia, which was a public corporation, went into operation, farms started reviving, and this was a direct threat to Firestone. And Firestone, I gathered from reliable sources, were one of the financiers, financiers of the coup. They didn't want the emergence of a government that would challenge their dominance. Question, the, and I, I understand that Tobin, in fact, was pressing Firestone to, uh, to, 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 to provide better living conditions for the workers. They didn't like that. So all of that. Then you had Liberian officials colluding against Tolbert. His own people. His own people. You think so? I know so. These are facts. The Minister of Finance. Who was the Minister of Finance at the time of the coup? Stuart Who was the Minister? I think it's one Phillips. No, James C. Phillips had been dismissed. Okay. Yeah. Who was the Minister of Finance? Evan Johnson said he was the Minister of Finance. Was she executed? She did not go to jail. Was she, did she go to jail? No. no. Sasha Dennis, foreign minister, who was the touch bearer of Tobo's non alignment policy, he was out of the country. He was prevailed upon by his by people here to come to attend a wedding. And he came to that wedding and he knew that the coup was coming. They knew. Wilfred Clark said that on the morning of the coup, massacre, Edward Massacre didn't go to work. Wilfred Clark was standing with Jebu communicating with assassins when the execution when Tobo was being assassinated. So well, it was all part of a plan. And elements of the true party, top elements of the government were part of that plan. They were part of that plan to overthrow Tobo. After the coup, 1980, the first goodwill delegation that went to the States in June 1980, the coup was April, May, June, to patch up relations to say well, the Americans stood by and said, well, we can't deal with this there's a military government. And when the officials, the 17 officials of government were being, were, 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 were going to put to the poll, if the U.S. ambassador here of the Americans had said, hot execution of the war stopped. What stopped them? Several Dennis went there for asylum. He was denied. At the U.S. embassy? Yes. yes. Several Dennis, he was denied. Why was he denied? The Minister of Finance, James T. Phillips, who had been dismissed, who was not in government, he was dragged from where he was. He was executed. The Minister of Finance, who was presiding over the country, talked about rampant corruption, and the Minister of Finance never called to account. Doesn't it say something to you? No, probably I, I need to call your back. You, I, I think you let the real meat out. Gongro, let's hear you got two minutes. Call 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 yeah, I gotta call your back. Yes, still. Probably there was a, this was an introduction. I think you let the meat out. The real thing we're supposed to talk are the things you started talking lately. But Gongro, let's hear you. Two minutes, we'll wrap up. Let me say this. April 4th. Because, because. Because I read, I read, I read from one book that when Talbot said he was no longer going to run, some some people in the True Party were not satisfied. They thought Talbot was Talbot wanted to leave and gave people like you the country to run, and you know they didn't, they, they were not happy about that. See, see what you need to come back here. <laughs> God bless let's hear you. So let me say this: on April 14, people miss maybe riot. Uh, the rice riot, mm -hmm. but it was a police riot, it was government riot, not the protesters riot. We were doing what the constitution at the time provided that we could peacefully assemble and petition our government. It was the government that started shooting at armless people and caused the violence. You tear guys them and then shoot at them while they are not looking. So many people got killed. The Brun there was a commission established by Tova, the Brunel Commission. The commission came and said the government was wrong and dismissed the Minister of Justice who ordered the police to shoot, dismissed the Minister of Finance, and then the So the 1979 Red Riot was investigated? Yes! yes. President Sully and the was a member of that commission. President Sully was a member of that commission. And they said the government was wrong? Yes. yes! And because of that, the Minister of Agriculture who proposed the increment she was dismissed. was dismissed. The Minister of Justice dismissed, the Minister of Finance dismissed. So let's get it clear that the government is a remitter is wrong. Yes! And they did wrong. Yes. I'm, I'm just hearing that. Yes. yes. Oh. And President Talbot said, I told the people to shoot at extremities. Yeah. He told, he, he told the, the security to shoot 
at the extremities, meaning the lower limbs. Is it yes. 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 They shoot at the legs. So, the other thing is, somebody said, the way that the, the progressive, I'm not in government, so I can't answer this. But what I understand is that even people, the civilians in government, they not know the decision the military had taken. 